Chapter 42, Caring for Clients with Eye Disorders, starting on page 718 in MedSurge Timby. Learning Objectives. Explain the different types of refractive errors. Differentiate the, times, the terms blindness and visually impaired. Identify appropriate nursing interventions for a blind client. Discuss the nursing management of clients with eye trauma. Describe the technique for instilling ophthalmic medications. Explain how different infectious and inflammatory eye disorders are acquired. Specify the visual changes that result from delayed or unsuccessful treatment of macular degeneration. Differentiate between open angle and angle closure glaucoma. Distinguish categories and mechanisms of actions of medications used to control intraocular pressure. Identify a category of drugs contraindicated in clients with glaucoma. Name activities clients with glaucoma should avoid because they elevate intraocular pressure. Describe methods for improving vision after a cataract is removed. Discuss post-operative measures that help prevent complications after a cataract extraction. Give classic symptoms associated with a retinal detachment. Discuss the care and cleaning of an eye prosthesis. One in three Americans have some form of vision impairing eye disease by 65 years of age. More than 21 million people in the U.S. have some degree of visual impairment, and this includes the more than 1 million who are legally blind. Legal blindness refers to a vision loss level that is defined in order to qualify individuals for specific benefits, such as Social Security disability benefits. Generally, this means that the client's better eye has a visual acuity of 20 over 200, or less with the best possible correction. This chapter discusses common disorders that can affect the eyes as well as the accompanying treatment and nursing care measures. Impaired vision. Refractive errors. Emetropia or normal vision means that light rays are bent to focus images precisely on the retina. In refractive errors, vision is impaired because the eyeball is either shortened or elongated and therefore light rays cannot sharply focus on the retina. Refractive errors include myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, and astigmatism. Myopia is nearsightedness. People who are myopic hold things close to their eyes to see them well. Hyperopia is farsightedness. People who are hyperopic opic, see objects that are far away better than objects that are close. Press biopia is associated with aging and results in difficulty with near vision. People with press biopia should hold reading material or handwork at a distance to see it more clearly. Astigmatism is visual distortion caused by an irregularly shaped cornea. Many people have both astigmatism and myopia or hyperopia. Box 42.1 presents a summary of refractive errors. Emotropia, normal refraction, parallel light rays are focused on the retina. Nearby vision requires contraction of ciliary muscle to bring objects into focus. Vision defects are present if light rays converge in front of or behind the retina or if the eyeball is shaped abnormally. Myopia is nearsightedness. Parallel light rays are focused in front of the retina as a result of increased anterior posterior diameter of the eyeball. Myopic persons cannot focus sharply on a distant object. As the individual moves closer to the object, the rays become more focused and the focal point finally falls on the retina. Hyperopia, farsightedness. The eyeball is abnormally short. Parallel light rays are focused behind, beyond the retina. Focus on distant objects occur through accommodation. As objects move closer to the eye, accommodation can no longer compensate and images become blurred. The near point is abnormally distant. Astigmatism, defect of the curvature of the cornea and lens producing refractive errors. Parallel rays are imperfectly focused on the retina. Light striking peripheral areas is bent at different angles and not focused on a single point on the retina. Question, what is astigmatism? Nearsightedness, farsightedness, associated with aging and difficulty with near vision, visual distortion caused by an irregularly shaped cornea.
D, visual distortion caused by an irregularly shaped cornea rationale. Myopia is nearsightedness. Hyperopia is farsightedness. Presbyopia is associated with aging and difficulty with near vision. And astigmatism is visual distortion caused by an irregularly shaped cornea. Pathophysiology and etiology. Refractive errors are inherited or occur as a result of surgical treatment of disorders of the cornea or lens. Myopia occurs in people with elongated eyeballs. Because of the excessive length of the eye, light rays focus in the vitreous body before they reach the retina. Hyperopia results when the eyeball is shorter than normal, causing the light rays to focus at a theoretical point behind the retina. See figure 42-1. Presbyopia occurs because of degenerative changes. Presbyopia is caused by the gradual loss of elasticity of the lens, which leads to decreased ability to accommodate or focus for near vision. The loss of accommodation progresses gradually. Astigmatism results from unequal curvatures in the shape of the cornea. Astigmatism results from unequal curvatures in the shape of the cornea. Assessment findings. People with refractive errors experience blurred vision. Some seek help for recurrent headaches caused by straining to see clearly. Refractive errors are detected with the Snellen and Jaeger charts. During retinoscopy, the vision of myopes, people who are myopic, improves when, improve when concave trial lenses correct the focusing power of the eyes. Hyperopes, people who are hyperopic, experience improvement when convex lenses are used. The amount of power needed to improve visual acuity indicates the degree of refractive error. The refractive error is not always the same in both eyes. Medical management. Refractive errors usually are corrected with eyeglasses or contact lenses. The lenses bend light rays to compensate for the refractive error. Not everyone can wear contact lenses. People with a history of recurrent eye infections, low tear production, or severe allergic reactions are more likely to have trouble with them. Surgical management. The number, a number of procedures are used to correct refractive errors. These include the following. Incisional radial keratotomy, which is RK. Under local anesthesia, the eye surgeon reshapes the cornea by making incisions. It is made flatter for clients with myopia and more cone-shaped for clients with hyperopia, enabling light rays to converge directly at the back of the retina. This procedure is not always successful. Some clients report a worsening of their vision. When RK is successful, clients no longer need to wear corrective lenses. Laser-assisted in situ keratomyelosis, also called LASIK. This procedure is the most common surgery for refractive errors. The eye surgeon uses a laser called a femato-second laser or a surgical blade microkeratome to create a thin corneal flap which is gently folded back to expose the inner cornea. A cool beam laser then re-sculpts the cornea flattens the cornea for myopia and makes it more cone-shaped for hyperopia and shapes the irregular cor corneal shape for clients with astigmatism. The flap is returned to its original position and sutures are not required. It heals in place. Eye drops and or ointments are used to, prom to promote healing. Vision generally is regained very quickly with little or no discomfort, but it can take three to six months for full stabilization of a client's vision. Wavefront guided LASIK. This type of LASIK surgery uses computer imaging technology to create a three-dimensional map of the client's cornea, which is used to program the ex excisomer uh, laser for surgery. Wavefront technology can measure very subtle abnormalities in the surface of the cornea, enabling wavefront guided LASIK to achieve vision correction beyond what is possible with glasses or conventional LASIK. Photorefractive keratectomy, PRK. This procedure uses an excimer laser, excimer laser to remove the epithelial la layer the top surface of the cornea. A laser sculpts the cornea to correct refractive errors without creating a flap. A bandage type contact lens promote epithelial healing and is used for about four days. There is some discomfort with PRK. Although LASIK is preferred because of more rapid recovery and lack of discomfort, PRK may still be used for clients with thin corneas. Intrastromal corneal ring segments. 
the eye surgeon implants these semicircular pieces of plastic through a small incision in the cornea to correct mild myopia. The implant changes the shape of the cornea. If necessary, ICRS can be reversed with the cornea resuming its original shape within a few weeks. Phacic intraocular lenses. Clients who do not have cataracts can have phacic intraocular lenses surgically implanted in front of their natural lenses. Because this procedure involves surgical incision into the eyeball, there is a higher risk of complications. This procedure is an option for clients who cannot safely have LASIK. It corrects more severe myopia or hyperopia, but preserves the client's ability to focus for near vision. Refractive Lens Exchange, RLE. This procedure is also referred to as clear lens extraction. An artificial lens is implanted in place of the client's lens, similar to cataract surgery. A multifocal lens can be implanted to correct all refractive errors. It does not have full food and drug administration approval. Currently, this procedure is generally done for clients with early stage cataracts or severe hyperopia. Conductive keratoplasty, CK. This procedure, used only for clients with presbyopia, involves the application of heat thermal refraction to the periphery of the cornea to make it tighter and steeper. Clients generally experience immediately improvement without discomfort. Retreatment may be necessary as this is not a permanent correction. Any procedure potentially provides complete correction of refractive error but can result in overcorrection or undercorrection. Other complications can include decentered ablation, dry eye syndrome, epithelial abrasion, or infection. With RK, increased glare from microscarring of the cornea may occur. With LASIK, the most common procedure, Complications include wrinkles in the flap, debris under the flap, a displaced flap, or infection or inflammation of the flap. Nursing management. Nurses, especially those in pediatric offices, industrial sites, community school systems, and public health clinics, perform screening examinations and refer clients to eye specialists. They are instrumental in teaching clients how to care for their corrective lenses and remove and clean contact lenses. See Client and Family Teaching 42-1. In addition, nurses provide preoperative and postoperative care and teach clients about postoperative care at home. Client and Family Teaching 42.2 provides some postoperative teaching points for clients having LASIK or PRK. Client and Family Teaching 42.1, care of eyeglasses and soft contact lenses. For eyeglasses, clean eyeglasses daily or more often if needed with warm water and soap or detergent or use a commercial glass cleaner. Rinse the glasses well and dry them with a microfiber cotton. Do not use paper tissues. The wood pulp from which they are made can scratch the lenses. Soft t-shirt material is a better choice. For soft contact lenses, wear and replace contact lenses according to the prescribed schedule. Minimize contact with water, removing lenses before swimming or getting in a hot tub. Do not store or clean contact lenses with water. Wash and rinse hands well before touching, touching lenses. Use a container that identifies the compartments for the right and left lenses. Remove a soft lens by sliding it onto the sclera and grasping it between the thumb and the forefinger. Use lens cleaner and eye drops recommended by your eye doctor. Follow directions for their use. Rub contact lenses with fingers, then rinse the lenses with solution before soaking them. The rub and rinse method is considered a superior cleaning method. Rinse the empty lens case with fresh solution, not water. Let it air dry. It is recommended that lens cases be replaced every three months. Do not use damaged or cracked lens cases. Take out the lenses and call the eye doctor right away if any of the following symptoms develop. Significant vision changes, red eyes, eyes that hurt or feel itchy, excessive tearing. Do not use saliva to clean the lenses. Do not use solutions for cleaning lenses other than those that have been recommended. Client and Family Teaching 42.2, post-operative instructions for laser-assisted in situ keratomyeliosis or photorefractive keratectomy. LASIK, understanding that the stitches are not needed, the corneal flap remains in place through natural eye pressure. Use antibiotic drops as ordered for up to one week to prevent infection. Resume normal activity within three days, but avoid strenuous exercise for one week. Avoid rubbing eyes for about a week. Realize that healing occurs within one week, but that it may take three to six months for vision to stabilize. Expect that discomfort may occur, 
for five to six hours after the procedure. If necessary, use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, for relief. PRK, photorefractive keratectomy. Use antibiotic and anti-inflammatory eye medications as ordered for two to five days after surgery. Understand that clear contact lenses are placed on each eye for two to five days to prevent infection. Understand that the epithelial layer begins to regenerate in two to five days, but realize that complete healing takes three to four months. Avoid rubbing eyes for at least several weeks. Avoid strenuous exercise for one week. Use pain medication for one to two days after surgery if necessary. Pain fibers are located on the surface of the cornea. Blindness and visual impairment. Definitions related to low vision refer to the best corrected visual acuity, abbreviated BCVA. As indicated in chapter 41, 20 over 20 is considered to be normal visual acuity. To pass a driving test, a visual acuity of 20 over 40 in at least one eye is commonly required. Low vision is defined as best corrected visual acuity of 20 over 70 or 20 over 200. Blindness is a legal term for a BCVA of 20 over 200 or less, even with corrective lenses. The term visually impaired is used to describe a BCVA between 20 over 70 and 20 over 200 in the better eye with the use of glasses. Many people who are considered blind perceive light and motion. People with severe loss of visual field are also referred to as blind and are not able to perceive light. The BCVA is defined as 20 over 400 to no light perception. Blindness can be congenital or caused by injury, a high fever that damages the optic nerve or disorders such as cataracts, glaucoma, retinal detachment, macular degeneration, and tumors. Medical management. Vision is improved to its maximum extent with corrective lenses. Clients who are severely visually impaired or blind are referred to a rehab center or other resource for supportive services. Blind or nearly blind clients are taught skills for independent living, how to use a cane for mobility, and how to read and write braille, a system that uses raised dots to form letters of the alphabet and numbers. Some individuals use trained guide dogs. Also see evidence-based practice 42.1, a discussion of teaching and earlier discovery of glaucoma. Nursing management, nursing process for the client who is blind. Assessment. In addition to assessing the degree of the client's impairment, ask questions about how the client is coping with his or her visual problems. Grief is a normal response to being newly blind or having severely compromised vision. Anger and sadness are typical reactions as clients face their disability. Help and support clients during depression. It is therapeutic to acknowledge the grief rather than attempt to cheer clients. Another helpful approach is to express confidence that the client has the inner resources to deal with the adversity. Possible diagnoses for nursing care plans, sensory deficit visual related to impaired vision, expected outcome, client will independently complete activities of daily living, Risk for injury related to compromised vision. Expected outcome, the client will remain free of trauma. Risk for impaired home maintenance related to decreased vision. The client will resume independent living. Situational low self-esteem related to impaired adjustment to loss of vision. Expected outcome, the client will redevelop a positive self-image. Interrupted family processes related to conflict and changed roles. The couple will remain cohesive and supportive. Deficient diversional activity related to transition from sighted to non-sighted. The client will develop interest in activities that contribute to the enjoyment and enrichment of life. Evaluation of expected outcomes. The client can perform self-care activities. He or she remains free of injury and demonstrates an ability to arrange for outside support to meet needs. The client expresses more positive feelings about ability to meet needs independently. The family provides positive support as evidenced by sharing, planning activities, and relying on one another. The client begins to access resources that provide diversional activities and support. 
gerontologic considerations. Visual impairment curtails activity of older adults such as work, balancing financial statements, reading, watching television, and engaging in hobbies or other forms of recreation that are important aspects of personal identity. Nursing interventions include assessment of subtle, specific changes in needs, referral to appropriate treatment, and referral to resources for visual assistive devices. Early identification and assistance with specific needs can help prevent depression, social isolation, and risk of falls. Older adults should be encouraged to use the level and placement of lighting that best enables visual visibility for safety to navigate at night. Visual disturbances that occur concurrently with other comorbidities such as respiratory, renal, or cardiac concerns or pain increase the risk of falls. Objects, chairs, electrical cords, rugs, and footstools are placed away from areas where the client walks and assistance may be needed whenever the client is out of bed. Nursing interventions for a blind client. Introduce yourself each time you enter the room because many voices sound similar. Call the client by name during group conversations because the blind client cannot see to whom questions or comments are directed. Speak before touching the client. Tell the client when you are leaving the room. In addition, the care of a client who is blind or whose vision is severely impaired includes but is not limited to the following, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Medical management. Vision is improved to its maximum extent with corrective lenses. Clients who are severely visually impaired or blind are referred to a rehab center or other resource. Blind or nearly blind clients are taught skills for independent living, how to use a cane, how to read and write braille, a system that uses raised dots. Some individuals use trained guide dogs. Eye trauma. Trauma or injury to the eye and surrounding structures can result in decreased or total loss of vision. Pathophysiology and etiology. Children and adults are subject to eye injuries from wind, suns, chemical sprays, direct blows to the eye, lacerations and penetrating objects such as fish hooks and bits of metal or wood. Cell and tissue injury causes an inflammatory response. Secondary infections may follow the initial injury. When trauma involves the cornea, scar tissue may affect the refraction of light. If the capsule that contains the lens is damaged, aqueous fluid and vitreous penetrate the lens, causing it to become an opaque cataract. Penetrating trauma can lead to endo endophthalmitis, a condition in which all three layers of the eye and the vitreous are inflamed. Removal of the eye may be necessary. Orbital fractures are classified according to their location. Vision can be impaired and there can also be potential injury to the brain if the orbital roof is fractured. Assessment findings. The injured eye is painful or described as feeling gritty. There is tear tearing and the client usually tries to relieve discomfort by squeezing the eyelids closed. The effort helps control eye movement and reduces the light entering the eye. Vision may be blurred. If the bony orbit is fractured, the eyes may appear asymmetrical and the client has diplopia, which is double vision. Blows to or near the eye usually results in swelling and bleeding into soft tissues with ultimate discoloration, a black eye of the area. On inspection, hemorrhage may be observed in the subconjunctival tissue. The eye may appear to recede into the orbit and there may be a change in the normal size or shape of the iris or pupil. Adjacent lid structures may be lacerated, bloody, and swollen. Shining a pen light obliquely across the eye detects an obvious or obscured foreign body. Sometimes the upper lid must be everted to detect an object trapped beneath. See figure 42.2. If treatment has been delayed, there may be purulent drainage in the conjunctival sac. Um, a rust ring is seen in retained foreign bodies that contain iron. Figure 42.2. To evert the eyelid. The examiner gently grasps the upper eyelashes and pulls downward, then places an applicator, in this case a long Q-tip, midway on the upper lid. The examiner uses slight pressure to evert the lid over the applicator. The eyelid resumes its normal position when the client looks upward or the eyelash is pulled gently forward. Diagnostic findings. Staining the surface with fluorescent dye identifies a minute foreign body or abrasion to the cornea. A slit lamp examination provides magnification and light to visualize structures in the anterior and posterior segments. 
x-rays, computed tomography, and possible MRI help find a penetrating foreign body. An x-ray or CT confirms an orbital fracture. Two types of ocular trauma require quick response, chemical burns and foreign objects in the eye. Chemical burns require irrigation with tap water or normal saline. Foreign bodies should not be removed if they are penetrating. The eye should be protected from further jarring or movement of the object. A metal eye shield, if available, or a stiff paper cup can be used to cover the eye following a traumatic injury until treatment is initiated by a qualified physician. After emergency first aid is performed, the eye is anesthetized to ease examination. Antibiotic ointment or drops are instilled and the eye may be patched depending on the nature of the injury. Clients with blunt trauma are hospitalized to reduce the danger of intraocular complications. To repair a laceration of the eyelid, the physician injects a local anesthetic and the lid margins are approximated with sutures. A cut on the eyeball, especially the cornea, is serious and requires immediate treatment. Surgery is performed if internal eye structures are damaged. Nursing management, acute pain, risk for infection, readiness for enhanced self-care are all diagnoses that you can use for this. Acute pain related to trauma of the eye or surrounding structures. Implement emergency care, such as inspecting the eye for a foreign body, dimming bright lights, and protecting the affected eye. Instill anesthetic drops under the direction or standing orders of a physician. Anesthetic eye drops reduce pain. Risk for infection related to disruption of corneal and conjunctival tissue. Wash hands. Use sterile solutions to irrigate the eye in non-emergency situations. Do not use a container of ophthalmic medication for anyone other than the client. Avoid contaminating the medication dropper or tube by holding the tip above the eye and adjacent tissue. Change gauze eye dressings on a regular basis using aseptic technique. Readiness for enhanced self-care. Teach the client to safely administer ordered antibiotic ointments and drops. Inform the client to wash hands thoroughly before administration of the eye medication. Observe the client in the self-administration of antibiotic ointment to the eye. If the client needs a patch, instruct the client on changing the patch after the installation of the antibiotic ointment. Inform the client to call the clinic if he or she experiences sudden pain or changes in vision. Recommend the use of glasses with shadow resistant lenses or safety goggles to prevent future eye trauma in situations where there is potential for flying objects or substances that can injure the eyes. Client and family teaching instilling eye medication at home. Wash your hands, wipe the lids and lashes in a direction away from the nose with a moistened soft gauze pad, paper tissue, or cotton ball. Use a separate item for each wipe. Pull the tissue near the cheek downward forming a sac in the lower lid. Tilt the head slightly backward and toward the eye in which the medication is to be instilled. Do not allow the tip of the container to touch the eye. Instill the prescribed number of drops into the conjunctival pocket or apply a thin ribbon of ointment directly into the conjunctival pocket beginning at the inner corner and moving outward. Close the eye gently. Wipe away excess medication that falls onto the skin. If there is a dressing, secure it to the face with tape and use an eye shield for additional protection, especially at night. Do not rub the eye and visit an ophthalmologist or return to the emergency department if the eye is not completely comfortable within a short time. Keep all follow-up visits to check the condition of the eye and surrounding structures. If an older adult has visual or arthritic changes or tremor, this client should demonstrate self-administration of eye drops to ensure ability to place the drops into the eye in the appropriate amount. In review, instilling ophthalmic medications, wash hands, wipe the lids and lashes with a separate um, material each time, pull the tissue near the cheek downward, tilt the head slightly backward, do not allow the tip of the container to touch the eye, instill ordered medications, close your eyes and close the patient's eyes and do not rub the eyes. Conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is an inflammation of the conjunctiva. It is commonly called pink eye because of inflammation of the subconjunctival blood vessels referred to as hyperemia. 
which makes them more visible and causes the reddish or pink appearance. Some forms are highly contagious. Pathophysiology and etiology. Conjunctivitis results from a bacterial, viral, or ricocetial infection and can affect one or both eyes. The microorganisms most often are introduced by air transmission, direct contact with sources on the fingers, a contaminated face towel or washcloth, or transmission from infected lesions near the eye. Allergic reactions, trauma from chemicals, or foreign bodies in the eye can also cause conjunctivitis. Allergic conjunctivitis affects both eyes. Exposure to allergens such as tree pollens causes production of the antibody immunoglobulin E, IgE, see chapter 33, which in turn causes the mast cells in the mucous membranes of the eyes and airways to produce histamines and other anti-inflammatory um, and other inflammatory substances. Untreated conjunctivitis, especially when caused by Neisseria, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, trachomatitis can lead to blindness. Assessment findings. Symptoms include redness, excessive tearing, swelling, pain, burning or itching, and possibly purulent drainage from one or both eyes. Clients may complain of photophobia, which is sensitivity to light. Infectious conjunctivitis conjunctivitis generally starts in one eye but may spread to the other eye through the hand contact. In infections with the herpes simplex virus, lesions appear on or near the lid margins. In severe cases, lymph nodes in the neck or throat are enlarged. Although a culture and sensitivity test can identify the causative microorganism more often than not, the disorder is diagnosed by visual inspection and a history of exposure to someone with similar symptoms. Medical management. Treatment for bacterial conjunctivitis may include antibiotic treatment, um, including ointment or drops, but often it will clear up without any treatment. There is no treatment for viral conjunctivitis, although an antiviral will most likely be prescribed for herpes simplex virus. Viral conjunctivitis generally runs its course in one to two weeks. Warm soaks or sterile saline irrigations are used to remove purulent drainage, reduce swelling, and relieve pain or itching. If an allergen causes the conjunctivitis, antihistamines and decongestants are prescribed. Nursing management. The nurse cleans the eye and instills or applies the prescribed medication. He or she provides health teaching so that the client can assume the necessary care independently. Because some forms of this condition are infectious, the nurse identifies methods for preventing its spread, including instructing the client to remain at home and apart from other people as much as possible while contagious, Use separate towels, linens, and other personal items. Wash hands often and thoroughly with soap and water. Use new tissue each time when wiping discharge from eye. Discard eye makeup items and do not use new makeup until conjunctivitis clears. Stop wearing contact lenses. For allergic conjunctivitis, try to avoid the allergens and wash clothes frequently. Return to physician if discharge becomes thick and yellow. Is the following statement true or false? Conjunctivitis is easily transmitted and can lead to blindness. This is true. Conjunctivitis is easily transmitted and can lead to blindness. Uveitis. Uveitis is an inflammation of the uveal tract which consists of the iris, ciliary body, and choroid. Pathophysiology and etiology. The cause of uveitis is not always identified, but one of the following may be the cause. Eye injury or surgery, infections or cancers, such as lymphoma. Although the disorder occurs randomly, it is detected with some frequency among clients with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, histoplasmosis, and herpes zoster infection. Because some of these diseases are autoimmune disorders, uveitis may be an atypical antigen antibody phenomenon. See chapter 33. Complications such as glaucoma, cataracts, and retinal detachment are known to occur secondary to uveitis. Assessment findings. Symptoms include blurred vision and photophobia. Eye pain is experienced in varying degrees. The eye appears red and congested and the pupil reacts poorly to light. In severe cases, a hypopion can occur, which is an accumulation of pus in the anterior chamber behind the cornea. Uveitis is confirmed by its clinical appearance during slit lamp examination. 
In severe cases, fluid from the eye may be extracted and examined. Angiography is used to determine retinal blood flow. Skin tests for primary disorders such as tuberculosis are performed to confirm or rule out this etiology. Medical and surgical management. Treatment includes oral and topical corticosteroids, anti-inflammatory, mydriatic dilating eye drops such, such as atropine, and antibiotic eye drops. Analgesics are prescribed for pain. Sunglasses reduce the discomfort of photophobia. For management of uveitis for some clients, a vitreotomy may be indicated to remove some of the vitreous. For conditions that are not resolving, a capsule is surgically implanted in the eye for the purpose of administering long-term, time-released corticosteroids. Clients may also be treated with long-term oral corticosteroids. Nursing management. The nurse instructs the client on the medication re regimen and drug administration technique and stresses adherence to therapy. Failure to follow the medication regimen can result in serious complications. The nurse also emphasizes the importance of close follow-up during treatment. Other instructions are similar to those for conjunctivitis in the preceding section. Keratitis and corneal ulcer. Keratitis is an inflammation of the cornea. A corneal ulcer is erosion in the corneal tissue. Pathophysiology and etiology. Trauma to the cornea, such as wearing hard contact lenses for an extended period or injury from an object that mars the integrity of the cornea, infectious agents such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites, or exposure to contaminated water can cause keratitis. Clients at risk include those who wear contact lenses and do not adhere to recommendations, those who are immunocompromised and or are taking steroids, and those who live in a warm climate and are exposed to plant materials in their eyes. In addition, clients who have had prior corneal injuries are more vulnerable to developing keratitis. Secondary infections are common once the epithelium is damaged. Most clients experience severe pain because of the abundance of nerve endings in the cornea. Inflammation and disruption of the tissue interferes with the transparency and smoothness of the cornea, temporarily impairing vision. When and if scar tissue forms, visual impairment is permanent. The degree of visual change depends on the size and density of the corneal scar tissue. Assessment findings. Keratitis is associated with localized pain or the sensation that a foreign body is present. Blinking increases the discomfort. Photophobia, blurred vision, tearing, purulent discharge, and redness develop. In addition to flashlight illumination and slit lamp examination, Fluorescin drops or strips provide evidence of corneal tissue erosion. Medical and surgical management. Treatment has begun promptly to avoid permanent loss of vision. Keratitis is treated with topical anesthetics, mydriatics, drugs that dilate the pupil, and local and systemic antibiotics. Dark glasses are recommended to relieve photophobia. It is sometimes recommended that clients patch the affected eye. Treatment in the early stages of corneal ulcer is the same as for keratitis. Once corneal scar tissue has formed, the only treatment is corneal transplantation called keratop keratoplasty, keratoplasty. Nursing management. The nurse removes exudate that harbors microbes and instills antibiotic eye medication. He or she follows aseptic techniques to avoid transferring microorganisms to the injured corneal tissues. The nurse advises the client who wears contact lenses to stop wearing them temporarily. Blepharitis. Blepharitis is an inflammation of the lid margins where eyelashes grow. It generally affects both eyes. Pathophysiology and etiology. One form of blepharitis is associated with hypersecretion from sebaceous glands, which causes greasy scales to form. This type often occurs in conjunction with dandruff of the scalp or seborrheic dermatitis found about the ears and eyebrows. Infectious agents such as staphylococci, cause other cases. Some cases are combinations of both. Other causes can include rosacea, allergies, or lice or mites in the eyelashes. Lepharitis can coexist with conjunctivitis and lead to the development of hordeola and chalasia, which are discussed later. Assessment findings. The lid margins appear inflamed. Patchy flakes cling to the eyelashes and are readily visible about the lids. Eyelashes may be missing. Purulent drainage may be present. Clients may also experience watery red eyes, red swollen eyelids, photosensitivity, and frequent blinking.
The condition is definitely diagnosed by scraping or swabbing the lid margins and examining the scales microscopically, although that is usually not necessary. Medical management. Medications in topical forms, drops, ointments that treat the underlying infection are prescribed. Topical and anti-inflammatories, drops or ointment may be prescribed as well. Topical cyclosporine may be prescribed for blepharitis caused by seborrheic dermatitis, rosacea, or eczema. The condition also improves with cleaning of the eyelids once or twice daily. Because seborrhea, excessive oiliness of the skin of the face and scalp is associated with blepharitis, frequent washing of the face and hair is recommended. Baby shampoo is recommended because it does not cause burning of the eyes. Only preparations labeled as ophthalmic are instilled in the eye. Check the label of the preparation carefully for the name of the drug, the percentage of the preparation, and a statement indicating that the preparation is for ophthalmic use. Nursing management. The nurse reinforces the instructions for conscientious performance of hygiene measures. Many clients become discouraged because the condition takes some time to improve. Noncompliance contribute, contributes to the chronicity of the condition. Cordiolum or sty is an inflammation and infection of the zeiss or mole glands, types of oil glands at the edge of the eyelid. Pathophysiology and etiology. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common causative pathogen. The microorganisms multiply in the oil gland, which initiates an inflammatory response. A collection of purulent exudate accompanies the inflammation in the channel of the gland. As debris accumulates, it causes swelling and localized discomfort. Sites are common in clients with diabetes mellitus because their glucose-rich blood readily supports microbial growth. Assessment findings. A sty appears as a tender swollen red pustule in the internal or external tissue of the eyelid. A culture of the exudate, although seldom performed, identifies bacterial pathogens. Medical and surgical management. Treatment of a sty includes warm soaks of the area and a topical antibiotic. Severe cases require incision and drainage. Nursing management. The nurse assures the client that treatment provides relief from pain and discomfort. The nurse explains how to avoid transferring microorganisms from the sty to areas of the body by cleaning the unaffected eye first and changing the washcloth, towel, and water after contact with the affected eye. The nurse also instructs the client to use separate fresh tissues, cotton balls, or gauze for each wiping stroke when cleaning exudate from the eye. Chalazion. Chalazion is a cyst of one or more meobomian glands, a type of sebaceous gland in the inner surface of the eyelid at the junction of the conjunctiva and lid margin. Pathophysiology and etiology. A chalazion forms when the meobian gland becomes obstructed and the release of sebaceous secretions is blocked. Consequently, the me meobomian gland becomes inflamed and enlarged. Assessment findings. A chalazion appears similar to a sty, but the swelling in the upper or lower eyelid is not tender. As the chalazion matures, it feels hard. The enlargement within the eyelid causes clients to feel self-conscious about their appearance and affects their visual acuity. If a chalazion grows large enough to obscure the pupil or compress corneal tissue, the distortion of vision is similar to that caused by astigmatism. Medical and surgical management. Treatment of a chalazion is not necessary if the cyst is small and does not interfere with vision. Warm soaks and massage of the surrounding area are prescribed to promote spontaneous drainage. If the cyst is firm, becomes infected, or interferes with closure of the eyelid, it is surgically excised. Nursing management. The nurse prepares the client for examination and treatment by a physician and gives instructions on methods for carrying out the treatment measures. Some points to include when teaching clients with infectious and inflammatory eye disorders are as follows. Adhere to the full course of prescribed drugs to achieve satisfactory results. Wash hands thoroughly before cleaning the eyelids, instilling eye drops, or applying eye ointment. Do not rub the eyes and keep hands away from the eyes. Use a separate washcloth or towel if the disorder is infectious. Do not use non-prescription eye products during or after treatment unless approved by the physician. Eliminate the use of eye cosmetics or use hypoallergenic products and replace them frequently to avoid harboring microorganisms. Keep all follow-up appointments. Macular degeneration is the breakdown of or damage to the macula, the points on the retina where light rays converge for the most acute visual perception. 
The disorder usually occurs in both eyes, but the vision in one eye tends to deteriorate more rapidly. Physiology and etiology. Age-related macular degeneration, AMD, tends to affect older adults. AMD is the leading cause of vision loss in clients older than 50 years of age. Risk factors for developing AMD include race, it is more common among whites, smoking, and family history. The National Eye Institute states that genetic components have been identified, but as yet there is not a specific genetic test for AMD. The main two main types of AMD are referred to as the dry type, non-neovascular, non-exudative, and the wet type, neovascular, exudative with exudate. In the dry type, which is the most common, the outer layers of the retina break down over a long period of time and characteristics, small yellowish deposits called drusen, D-R-U-S-E-N, are apparent under the retina. When drusen forms within the macula, the client gradually experiences blurred vision. There are three stages defined for dry AMD. Early dry AMD. Clients either have small or very Few drusen and vision may not be affected. Intermediate dry AMD, the number of drusen are either increased or there are a few large drusen. Clients may have a blurred spot in their vision and need more light to do tasks that require close vision, such as reading. Advanced dry AMD, in addition to drusen, there is a breakdown of light-sensitive cells supporting tissue in the macula. Dry AMD does not have any treatment or cure. The wet type has two classifications. The first is called classic choroidal neovascularization. It has a more abrupt onset and is characterized by enlarged drusen. The underlying problem stems from an opening between one of the mem membranous layers of the retina and the choroid. Serous fluid seeps into the separation and elevates an area of the retina like a blister. One or more blood vessels grow into the defect and produce a subretinal hemorrhage. After the bleed, scar tissue forms. The damage almost always is confined to the macular area and vision loss can be severe. The second form of wet type macular degeneration is termed occult choroidal neovascularization. It differs from the classic form in that the new vessel growth and leakage is less pronounced, resulting in vision loss that is less severe. Assessment findings. In dry macular degeneration, blurred vision is the first symptom of disease which becomes more noticeable when clients try to read or do close work. In wet macular degeneration, clients experience distortion of vision, such as straight lines appearing wavy or letters and words looking broken. A client's perception of color may also be diminished. When the macula becomes irreparably damaged, clients compare their vision to a target in which the bull's eye area of the, of the image is absent. See figure 42.4. The peripheral field or side vision is unaffected, but the client cannot see images by looking at them directly. Fluorescein angiography shows pooling of the dye in the blister area. Optical coherence tomography uses fiber optics to provide images of the ocular tissue structure. The Amsler grid, see figure 42-5 on page 729, is used to determine if the client has changes in central vision. AMD can cause lines on the grid to disappear or to appear wavy. Medical management. There are several treatment options for wet AMD. Angiogenesis inhibitors. Used to inhibit the development and progression of abnormal blood vessel formation, angioniasis. These medications are directly injected into the vitreous, the intravitreal injection. Drugs include R-A-N-I-B, I-Z-U-M-A-B, trade name Lucentis, P-E-G-A-P-T-A-N-I-B, trade name Macugen, B-E-V-A-C-I-Z-U-M-A-B is Avastin, and A-F-L-I-B-E-R-C-E-P-T, which is Aaliyah. See page 729. These drugs are injected every four to eight weeks. A transient loss of vision related to increased intraocular pressure, burning sensation, eye pain, and floaters may occur. Photodynamic therapy uses an intravenous injection of photosensitizing drug and non-thermal laser application to reduce proliferation of abnormal blood vessels and eliminate the risk to the retina. Laser photocoagulation seals the serous leak and destroys the encroachment of blood vessels in the area. It must be performed early to prevent progression of the disorder. 
macular translocation. This is a surgical procedure for wet AMD. A retinal detachment is created, moving the retina to a healthier spot so that the macula is at a slight distance from the area of choroidal neovascularization. Laser treatments can then be used without as much risk to the macula. Central vision is improved as a result. Implantable miniature telescope. IMT, a tiny telescope inserted in one eye allows for central vision, whereas the other eye provides peripheral vision. Clients who have this procedure are at the end of stage of wet AMD. They require some vision rehab to adapt to the changes in sight. Vitamin and mineral formulation, a combination of vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, which is vitamin A, zinc oxide, and cup cupric oxide, copper, has been found to reduce the risk of developing advanced AMD and severe vision loss. Research has demonstrated that clients with intermediate AMD in one or both eyes or advanced AMD in one eye benefit from the vitamin and mineral formulation. Clients who are healthy or have early AMD do not benefit. Diet. Clients with AMD are instructed to eat a healthy diet. Diet. Clients with AMD are instructed to eat a healthy diet that includes two to three servings of cold water fish like salmon per week and daily servings of leafy green vegetables and a variety of fruits and other vegetables. Clients with AMD may be pro provided with suggestions for coping with a visual impairment. Aids such as magnifying glasses may be of value and high intensity reading lamps have helped some people. The ophthalmologist may refer the client to a specialized center for evaluation and selection of assistive devices. Nursing management. The nurse helps the client cope with loss of vision. For additional nursing management of the client with permanent visual impairment, review the information that accompanies the previous discussion on blindness. Nutrition Notes 42.1, page 729. Nutritional therapy to reduce the rate of macular degeneration development includes inclusion of carotenoids, lutein and xanthan, antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc and copper, and fatty acids, known as EPA and DHA. Sources of these phytochemicals include dark green leafy vegetables, broccoli, peas, kiwi, red grapes, oranges, corn, mangoes, honeydew melon, oily fish, and flaxseed. The risk of developing macular degeneration can be reduced by as much as half in people who eat spinach or collard greens two to four times per week as compared with people who eat these vegetables less than once per month. Question. Is the following statement true or false? Macular degeneration affects peripheral vision. The answer is false. Macular degeneration affects central vision. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is a group of eye disorders caused by an imbalance between the production and drainage of aqueous fluid. When the drainage system is obstructed, the anterior chamber becomes congested with fluid and intraocular pressure, IOP, rises. Optic nerve damage can result as a result of the increased IOP. Although there is not a cure for glaucoma, the disease symptoms can be controlled and optic nerve damage can be prevented. Pathophysiology and etiology. Glaucoma is the leading cause of blindness for people over 60 in the U.S. It is estimated that 3 million Americans have glaucoma, although as many as half are not diagnosed. Risk factors for being diagnosed with glaucoma include being over the age of 60, being of black or Hispanic origins, having a family history of glaucoma, and having conditions such as myopia, which is nearsightedness, and hypertension. Normally, aqueous fluid, humor fluid, fluid fills the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye, flowing from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber through the pupil. See figure 426A, page 730. It flows through the trabecular mesh between the iris and the cornea, draining into the canal of Schlem, a vein that circles around the iris for return to the venous circulation. In normal eyes, the rate of secretion equals the rate of outflow and the IOP is between 10 to 21 millimeters mercury. IOP is a balance of several factors. Rate of aqueous humor production by the ciliary body, the resistance to flow between the iris and ciliary body, the rate of removal by the drainage system, trabecular meshwork, and the canal of Schlem. For clients with glaucoma,
The aque aqueous humor is impeded from flowing out properly. There are several types of glaucoma, open angle or chronic glaucoma, angle closure or acute glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma, congenital glaucoma, or secondary glaucoma. Open angle glaucoma is the most common form. Its onset is slow and the client may not experience noticeable symptoms for several years. Open angle glaucoma occurs when structures in the drainage system, trabecular meshwork and canal of Schlem, degenerate and the exit channels for aqueous fluid become blocked. See figure 42-6b. As the intraocular pressure rises, it causes edema of the cornea, atrophy of nerve fibers in the peripheral areas of the retina, Open angle glaucoma occurs when structures in the drainage system, the trabecular meshwork and canal of Schlem, degenerate and the exit channels for aqueous fluid become blocked. See figure 42-6b, page 730. As the IOP rises, it causes edema of the cornea, atrophy of nerve fibers in the peripheral areas of the retina, and degeneration of the optic nerve. This type of glaucoma develops painlessly and visual changes occur slowly. When discovered, the ocular damage can already be severe. Angle closure glaucoma. Angle closure glaucoma is less common, but the onset is very sudden and immediate recognition and treatment are required to prevent blindness. It occurs in people who have an anatomically narrow angle at the junction where the iris meets the cornea. See figure 42-6C on page 731. This deviation makes them vulnerable to angle closure when nearby structures protrude into the anterior chamber and occlude the drainage pathway. For example, an attack can be precipitated when the iris thickens in response to a mydriatic drug by pupil dilation while sitting in the dark, or when the lens enlarges with age and bulges forward. This type of glaucoma is an emergency and a delay in treatment may result in partial or total loss of vision in the affected eye. Normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma occurs in some individuals. Intraocular pressures are within normal range but optic nerve damage and loss of vision still occur. Congenital glaucoma is seen early in life and is familial. Secondary glaucoma occurs following administration of some medications such as steroids, following ophthalmic infections or as the result of systemic diseases or ocular trauma. Signs and Symptoms Clients with open angle glaucoma may be asymptomatic and the condition may not be discovered until the client has a routine ophthalmologic examination. When symptoms do occur, they are often ignored because they are not dramatic. Clients may complain of eye discomfort, occasional and temporary blurred vision, the appearance of halos around lights, reduced peripheral vision, and the feeling that their eyeglass prescription needs to be changed. In contrast, clients with acute angle closure glaucoma become symptomatic quite suddenly. They experience severe headache and eye pain. The eyes become rock hard and sightless. Nausea and vomiting may occur. The conjunctiva is red. The cornea becomes cloudy and is commonly described as appearing steamy. The attack is self-limiting, but with each subsequent attack, vision becomes more impaired. Diagnostic findings. The optic disc, when visualized directly with an ophthalmoscope or with retinal angiographic photographs, shows a cupping effect, widening and deepening. When the anterior chamber of the eye of a client with angle closure glaucoma is inspected with a pen light or slit lamp, the angle between the iris and cornea is narrow. Tonometry reveals elevated IOP and reduced aqueous outflow. The visual field examination demonstrates a loss of peripheral vision. Nasal and superior areas are usually impaired first. Other tests used to monitor glaucoma, particularly the optic nerve and internal structures, include scanning laser, polar, and polar imagery, and optical coherence tomography. Ultrasound, bio, micro, 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 microscope evaluates how fluids flow through the eye angles. Pachymetry using ultrasound sonography measures corneal thickness, which affects IOP. A very thin cornea increases the risk of glaucoma. Gonoscopy uses special lenses to better visualize the eye structures, in particular the drainage angle to determine the type of glaucoma. These methods not only establish a baseline, but also determine whether the glaucoma has progressed. Medical management. Treatment for glaucoma is aimed at achieving the greatest benefit at the least risk, cost, and inconvenience to the client. 
Although treatment cannot reverse optic nerve damage, further damage can be controlled. Treatment is most often begun with a topical medication at the lowest dose and then advanced to increase the dosage until the desired IOP level is reached and maintained. Clients with open angle glaucoma use tip topical beta blockers such as Timolol, Timoptic is the trade name. See Drug Therapy Table 42-1. Beta B blockers decrease the flow rate of aqueous humor in the eye. Prostaglandins such as Latanoprost, brand name Zalatin, and Bimomatoprost is brand name is Lumigan, that increase the outflow of the fluid in the eye and reduce IOP are also used to treat glaucoma. Other medications to control ILP may be given. As many as four topical medications may be used at a time. Myotics such as myostat, known as the generic name C-A-R-B, A-C-H-O-L, and pilocarpine, generic name, trade name pilocar, constrict the pupil. These medications pull the iris away from the drainage channel so that the aqueous fluid can escape. Other eye medications that are used for lowering IOP include E-C-H-O-T-H-I-O-P-H-A-T-E, iodide, trade name phosphaline iodide, epinephrine and dipiprofen, trade name propene. Diamox is a trade name, generic name is A-C-E-T-A-Z-O-L-E-Z-O-L-A-M-I-D-E, again A-C-E-T-A-Z-O-L-A-M-I-D-E, and generic name M-E-T-H-A-Z-O-L-A-M-I-D-E, trade name Neptazine, which are carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. They slow the production of aqueous fluid. Oral medications, including carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, such as Diamox and Daranide, may be used to supplement or replace topical medications. However, side effects such as frequent urination, kidney stones, nausea, and depression are more problematic with the oral preparations. Diamox's generic name is acetazolamide. Generic name for daranide is dichlorophenamide. This is on page 731. Surgical management. When adherence to treatment is poor, the client fails to instill eye drops as directed, or drug therapy no longer is effective. In other words, the IOP fails to decrease sufficiently. Or if the client develops severe adverse reactions to the medications, more aggressive treatment becomes necessary to save vision. There are a number of potential procedures that may be done to create accessory drainage channels with the goal of promoting the drainage of aqueous humor and reducing IOP. Laser surgeries are used extensively in the treatment of glaucoma depending on the type and severity. See Table 42.1. This describes some of the procedures currently available. The particular laser surgery selected depends on the type of glaucoma and its severity. Lasers use a focus beam of light to create a very small burn or opening in the eye tissue, depending on the strength of the light beam. Laser surgeries are usually performed in an outpatient setting. During the laser surgery, the eye is numbed so that there is little or no pain. Procedures vary in length. Clients generally can resume normal activities within 24 hours. The longevity of surgical results depends on the type of laser surgery, the type of glaucoma, age, race, and many other factors. Some people may need the surgery repeated to better control IOP. Medications are usually still needed to manage IOP, but possibly dosages can be reduced. Nursing management. The nurse determines the client's history of symptoms, the medications that have been prescribed, and whether the client is adhering to the prescribed medication schedule or taking any other medications. It's also important to ask when the client was first diagnosed with glaucoma. Acute angle gl closure glaucoma is an emergency. The nurse refers the client for medical treatment immediately because vision can be permanently lost in one to two days. Severe pain requires analgesics. To promote the maximum effect from analgesic drug therapy, it is essential to limit sensory stimulation such as loud noise, activity, and movement. The nurse informs the physician immediately if the client states that the pain has worsened despite treatment. While clients are incapacitated by their pain, or if the disease results in loss of vision, the nurse assists with meeting basic needs. Mydriatics, drugs that dilate the pupil, must never be administered to clients with glaucoma. 
The nurse consults the physician if drugs with anticholinergic properties such as atropine sulfate are prescribed because dilation of the pupil can further obstruct drainage of aqueous fluid, raise IOP, and damage whatever vision remains. In review, clients with open angle glaucoma use topical beta blockers such as Timolol also known as brand name Timoptic. Beta blockers decrease the, fl the flow rate of aqueous humor into the eye. Prostaglandins such as latanoprost, known as zelatin, and bimetroprost, known as lumigen, that increase the outflow of the fluid in the eye and reduce IOP are also used to treat glaucoma. Glaucoma medication contraindication. Mydriatics, drugs that dilate the pupil, must never be administered to clients with glaucoma. Is this true or false? True. Is the following statement true or false? Mydriatics must never be administered to clients with glaucoma. True. Mydriatic drugs, drugs that dilate the pupil, must never be administered to clients with glaucoma. Regarding glaucoma, activities to avoid so as not to increase intraocular pressure, coughing, and vomiting. Cataracts, pathophysiology and etiology. As a result of aging process, it could be congenital, it could be uh, formed from lens injury, and it could be a secondary condition. Assessment findings, halos, difficulty in reading, color vision changes, reduced vision, and distorted vision. Diagnostic findings, the Snellen chart, ophthalmoscope, and slit lamp examination, and tonometry. Surgical management, intracapsular or extracapsular extraction, and phacoemulsification. emulsification. Post-op vision restoration includes corrective glasses, contact lens, and an IOL implant. Retinal detachment. In retinal detachment, the sensory layers become separated from the pigmented layer of the retina. See figure 42-9, page 736. Pathophysiology and etiology. In general, retinal separation is associated with a hole or tear in the retina caused by stretching or degenerative changes. Retinal detachment may follow a sudden blow, penetrating injury, or eye surgery. Tumors, hemorrhage in front of or behind the retina and loss of vitreous fluid are particularly likely to lead to retinal detachment, such as advanced diabetic changes in the retina. In many instances, the cause of retinal detachment is unknown. Retinal separation is more common after 40 years of age. The separation of the two layers of the retina deprives the sensory layer of its blood supply. Vision is lost in the affected area because the sensory layer can no longer receive visual stimuli. Vitreous fluid moves between the separated layers of the retina, holding the layers apart and causing further separation. Three types of retinal detachment have been identified. R-H-E-G-M-A-T-O-G-E-N-O-U-S, regmatogenous. Fluid moves under the retina through a tear and separates it from the pigmented layer. This is the most common form. Tractional, tension or pulling force causes scar tissue to form on the retina surface and eventually the retina separates from the pigmented layer. Exudative, fluid moves under the retina secondary to inflammatory disorders or injury to the eye. There are no tears in the retina, macular degeneration or uveitis. Assessment findings, many client notice Clients notice definite gaps in their vision or blind spots. They describe the sensation of a curtain being drawn over their field of vision and often see flashes of light, seeing spots, cobwebs, or moving particles in one's field of vision, called floaters, is common. Complete loss of vision may occur in the affected eye. The condition is not painful, but clients are extremely apprehensive. When the retina is inspected with an ophthalmoscope, the tissue appears gray in the detached area. Surgical management. Surgical interventions for retinal reattachment include laser surgery, cyropexy, 
diathermy, retinopexy, and scleral buckling. The method chosen depends on the extent of detachment. Several procedures are used for small tears or holes. Laser surgery, called photocoagulation, involves making small burns around the tear to attach the retina back in place. The exudate that forms between the retina and choroid results in adhesion of the retina to the choroid. Cyropexy, which is freezing, involves the application of a supercooled probe to the tear, assisting the retina to reattach. Diathermy uses electric current to heat the tissue around the tear. Pneumatic retinopexy is less invasive method used to repair larger retinal tears. Methods described previously are used to seal the tear. A gas bubble is then injected within the vitreous to push the detached retina against the sclera. The gas bubble expands at first but then disappears within two to six weeks. A disadvantage of this procedure is that the client may have to position himself or herself in a face down position for a certain period of time each day for seven to ten days following the procedure. However, it is simpler and less expensive than other surgical procedures. Scleral buckling indenting of the surface of the eye is a surgical procedure in which a tiny synthetic band is attached outside the eyeball to lightly push the wall of the eye against the detached retina. See figure 42-10. Sometimes a vitrectomy in which the vitreous is removed and replaced by gas to help reattach the retina is also performed. As healing occurs, the eye produces fluid that fills the eye and takes the place of the gas. With both scleral buckling and vitrectomy, the use of laser or cyropexy welds the retina back in place. Nursing management. Anyone with sudden loss of vision is referred immediately for examination by a physician. Clients are kept on bed rest and sometimes positioned on their side with the affected eye in dependent position. If the tear is on the left side, the client will lie on his or her left side until surgery is performed. Sedation may be ordered. The eyes are patched and covered with an eye shield. Mydriatic eye drops are instilled as ordered to dilate the pupil and facilitate further examination of the retina. If surgery is performed, the client is kept on bed rest with position restrictions for several days. The head may be immobilized. The client is not turned or moved without orders. If an air bubble is instilled to promote contact between the retina and sclera, the client is positioned with the face parallel to the floor so that the bubble floats to the posterior of the eye. If floaters are seen after the eye heals, the nurse can tell the client they eventually become absorbed or settle to the inferior floor of the eye out of the line of vision. For additional post-operative nursing management, see Nursing Care Plan 42-1 on page 737. Assessment. Nursing Care Plan. Clients having any kind of eye surgery require the usual pre-op care. For, frequently they have surgery in ambulatory care settings and so pre-operative assessments may be done before the day of surgery. Pre-op vital signs provide a baseline for post-op monitoring. Because this client is having a sclerobuckle procedure, in this case, it is important to ask about scheduled and other medications the client takes. Check to ensure that instructions about withholding any medication before surgery were followed. Examples include the following. Anticoagulation therapy withheld as ordered. For example, if the client takes warfarin or Coumadin, a prothrombin time of 1.5 is the desired level before surgery. Aspirin withheld for five to seven days. NSAIDs withheld for three to five days. In addition, check the post-op orders and administer eye drops as ordered. Ophthalmic hemorrhage or increased intraocular pressure. Expected outcome bleeding and IOP will be managed and minimized. Interventions. Report sudden, intense, and persistent pain immediately. The pain may indicate hemorrhage or increased IOP, which may require emergency surgery. Instruct the client to avoid coughing, vomiting, straining at stool, bending forward, or lifting anything heavier than 5 pounds. Avoiding these activities prevent the IOP from rising. The evaluation, expected outcome, client experiences no complications. Nursing diagnosis, pain related to surgery. Expected outcome, client will experience little or no pain or discomfort. Although post-op discomfort is usually manageable, acknowledge the client's discomfort and administer prescribed analgesic that is appropriate for the level of pain. Keep room lights dim, provide dark glasses if light causes discomfort. Use a clean cloth rinsed in very warm water, not scalding, as a gentle compress over the affected eye for mild discomfort. Expected outcome, client reports little or no pain.
post-operative management of the client undergoing a scleral buckle procedure for a retinal detachment continues. Risk for infection related to impaired tissue integrity. The incised tissue will heal without evidence of infection. Perform conscientious hand washing before an eye assessment or treatment procedure. Follow principles of asepsis when cleaning the eye or reapplying a clean shield or warm compress. Keep the tips of all medication applicators clean. Report any yellow or foul-smelling drainage to the surgeon. Expectations, the eye heals without evidence of redness, swelling, or unusual drainage. Risk for injury related to comp compromised vision and surgical procedure. Client safety and vision will be maintained. While client is in the post-op unit, raise the side rails and identify the location of the signal device. Encour encourage client risk for injury related to compromised vision and surgical procedure. Client safety and vision will be maintained. While client is in the post-op unit, raise the side rails and identify the location of the signal device. Encourage client to use a dim light or night light in the room after sundown. Apply a shield over the patched eye for at least three weeks at night. Shower and wash hair carefully. Do not scrub vigorously and avoid getting soap in the eye. If the shield is worn in the shower, replace it with a clean, dry one after the shower. Position body according to instructions if needed assist to holding the retina in place. This can be face down positioning, reclining, lie on stomach, hug soft pillows under the chest and head, position head at an angle, direct gaze toward mattress, face down positioning, seated rest forehead on back of hand, position head parallel with the floor, direct eye gaze toward the floor. Sitting up for meals and ambulating to the bathroom is permitted as well as sitting for periods of time. Do not lie on your back, do not fly, or at least two weeks until the gas bubble is absorbed because vision will slowly improve following a surgery. Take care and do not give uh, the patient, don't, do not allow them to drive or engage in activities that require visual acuity for a few weeks. Maintain work restrictions for at least a month, especially if work requires straining or rapid activities. Sugar pine is bigger. Enucleation. Enucleation is the surgical removal of an eye. It is necessary when the eye is destroyed by injury or disease, when a malignant tumor develops, which is rare, or to relieve pain if the eye is severely damaged and sightless. Sometimes only the contents of the eyeball are removed and the sclera is left in place. Other times the entire eyeball is removed as well as tissues in the bony orbit. Medical and surgical management. When a nucleation is performed, a metal or plastic ball is buried in the capsule of connective tissue from which the eyeball is removed. A pressure dressing is applied to control hemorrhage, a complication of enucleation. After the tissues have healed, a shell-shaped prosthesis is placed over the buried ball. See figure 42-11, page 739. The shell is painted to match the client's remaining eye. The shell is the only portion that is removed for cleaning. Nursing management. The nurse observes the client after surgery for signs and symptoms of bleeding or infection. The client is usually allowed out of bed the day after surgery. When healing is complete in about two to four weeks, the nurse teaches the client how to insert and remove the prosthetic shell. The prosthesis typically is removed before going to bed and inserted again the next morning. The nurse instructs the client to hold the head over a soft surface such as a bed or padded table when removing or inserting the prosthesis to avoid damage if the prosthetic eye falls. The client should clean the shell after removal and keep it in a safe place where it will not become scratched or broken. This is the end of the slideshow.